Hello and welcome to Wake and Jake with myself, David Mendelson, and Bailey Foolish, or Foolish Bailey, or Bailey, I forget if we can share your last name, uh, Bailey F., uh, but he's an A on the report card, uh, and we are going to go through the Foolish 50, uh, always hot in the street topic, Bailey, uh, and welcome back to baseball season, man. How you doing? I'm doing well. Yeah, I did share my last name with you all. It is out there. You yeah. said Bailey F., uh, but I, in <laughs> fact, you know, share a last name with a with a once famous brave turned Dodger. So from now on, you can refer to me as Bailey Hayward. Yes, <laughs> Hayward yeah. Bay. Uh, it's a it's actually a full football baseball connection. Um, man, I'm I'm excited to yuck with you. We we got through the long and cold off season, and now baseball is actually back. And boy, Bailey, you should see all these Yankee fans marching around our office. Ooh. It is delightful. Uh, They're walking with their heads held high. I'm sure it's insane. I mean, the contrast between. The second half of last season to the first six days of this season is just unreal, and it's stupid how much it controls our emotions. Um, while I guess you, as a Braves fan, in your heart of hearts, I, I don't know, same old story. We'll see you in October. Yeah, it's it's pretty easy to be a Braves fan right now. The team plays great, and you say, "Well, that's what I expected to happen," and uh, we'll just see what happens in October because they will be there. God, it's not not a bad life. Uh, Bailey, let's get into your Foolish 50 list. I did something that I don't normally do. Uh, I re-listened to our episode from last year, uh, because I, I wanted to see, uh, you know, some, some of the hot takes and cold takes. Yeah. Um, no, man, it was honestly, it was pretty good. Uh, I, I think I, I asked you and it's a question I'll, I'll ask you again. I was like, who are... Who are two guys from your list who you think won't be on the list next year? Which is a kind of a brutal question, but uh, you said Jeff McNeil, who is not on the list, um, and then you did say Luis uh, Robert, which hey, that was coin flippy at the time, and and we walked ourselves through that one. Um, I had a again, I should have made socials clip it, but I was like, hey, you know, we talked Ronald Acuna a little bit, and I was like, that's a good sprinkle for MVP, so I should just post that on my Instagram and follow me for more hot tips. Um, <laughs> and then I was trying to think, there was a, I was, I was infatuated with Dansby last year, uh, just because it's like, wait, this guy is just making an argument for like annual best shortstop but for some reason he doesn't feel that way so I was happy to see him sneak on your list uh for this year and uh would you like to comment on putting Garrett Cole at 50 for clicks or no yeah I mean it's it, you know it's it's a, I made it sort of abundantly clear in the video it was about just looking at the value he could put up on the field this year so uh, you know, he's going to miss the, those first two months of the season. We know that. I think there's pessimism. He could miss more than that. But uh, I put him at 50 for the clicks, and uh, I'll be very transparent about that. <laughs> hey, man, sometimes that works. Um, and I hope I hope that he can live up to that if he does come back in like a month or so. There's a chance. Um, yeah, man, the injuries are crazy. And I, I, I was going through the list of, uh, guys who uh, were on the list last year that were not on the list this year. And it's littered with just injured guys, which makes a ton of sense. I, I mean, Justin Verlander, Scherzer, uh, McClanahan, uh, Sandy, DeGrom. Like, you know, th to put those guys on your top 20, 24 list, uh, that would, that's a foolish task, if you will. Um Man, I, I guess the guys that fell off the list, Springer and McNeil, I, I want to say those are kind of similar boats. I was pretty, I was sad where George Springer's numbers landed last year, and that doesn't, that obviously doesn't mean he can't bounce back, but when you're doing the top 50, uh, as you noted in your video, there's only room for 50. Um, yeah. Compliments to you on that. Uh, let's see, I was, I was a little surprised, and again, this is, for me, last year, I did the activity of uh, top 10 in the worst, uh, which we decided to get extra silly with on our end because it hit a point of just like, okay, what are we doing here? Uh, this year, I did the tier list with Jolly Olive, who 
uh, I did pass on your happy grape message, and it, it's now become a a nice thing between you two. <laughs> That's good. What what would the equivalent be for me? Like silly softball or something? Yeah, well, <laughs> I'll uh, you know what? I will pitch it to Jolly that he gets the the first punch back. And I have decided. Uh, I think I need to get you two on one episode this year, um, and just have it out. I don't even know what you guys could have it out on. Um. Just being well thought out, maybe. Uh, so I'm I'm gonna figure that out, and that episode will end with me being the worst person pitching you guys ideas uh, for videos that you should do, and you guys just duel on them. Um, maybe we'll do it as like a mock exercise. You each get a hundred bucks, uh, and yeah. I'll make you bid on bid on my. Who wants the Nick Martini video? Are you are you inventing like uh, around the horn? Is that what this is? <laughs> I think. I think, whoa, hey, we don't, I would never say that, but make sure you guys tune in, uh, and we're going to give out points. Um, so I don't know. I'm, I'm excited. Uh, I think myself being a not thought out person, bring together two of baseball's best, uh, video essay men in the world. Um, I don't know. I'm going to figure something out there, but back to this. Um, I, I guess it's, it was surprising seeing like, a guy like Xander Bogarts, who uh, ain't not on the list, which, again, I you know, with one good year, he could easily be back. Even Real Mudo, seeing where his season-ending numbers uh, ended up, and that was another fun convo we had last year. Um, and this is where my big brother will kick in. Uh, when you do this, Liz Bailey, believe. Because last year you, you had Adley below JT. And I kind of hit you with like, uh, I think you probably want Adley over JT. And you were kind of like, I do, but he's JT Real Mudo. Um, so I don't know. I, I guess of the names that fell off the list, Correa's another one. My goodness. Uh, I think he was, was he ninth last year? And I, I'm and getting, 12th. this is the Band-Aid part. This is let's get all those bad memories out of the way. Right. Um it, it did drive home to me uh, how crazy this year is for Carlos Correa's, like, outlook. Um, because, man, if he has another lackluster year with all the injuries and stuff like that, but if he has a great 130-plus uh, gold glove year, it's like, wait, he is back in the top 20 of players. Uh, and it's, it's the fun part of baseball. So I guess of those of those older veteran guys that kind of dropped out, which, which one stung the most for you? Uh, it was definitely Xander and Brandon Nimmo. Okay. Um, because I felt like they both had seasons that were in the range of top 50 value. and But the tricky thing is with this list is you kind of have to balance the floor with the upside. And so I look at, you know, let's look at, you know, 49, 48 right there. You know, those are two guys who just barely got on the list and Guerrero and Arenado, we know season to season, those guys have insane upside. We know those guys can be MVP finalists, you know? And uh, so when when you look at someone like Bogarts or Nimmo, who's more consistent, but maybe the ceiling isn't as high, that's tough to balance out because you, you know there's a good possibility at the end of the year they will finish a, a top 50 player by war. But, you know, you have players who, uh, you know, could win MVP awards, and I don't want to be the guy that leaves off an MVP winner entirely on a top 50 right. list because that's going to make it look really bad. Yeah, okay. I I respect that. I, I respect that because you're right. That's – um as – as someone who posted a picture of themselves on the internet wearing a half Yankees, half D-backs jersey yesterday and just dealing with the ridiculous internet guff that comes with that, yeah, man, I, I can I respect that play at the end of the... If you've got, you know, if Vladdy goes nuts this year, uh, you know, Bogarts' is best is what? Like, wow, Xander was incredible this year. He actually he finished seventh in the MVP Vladdy's best. He he could like win the damn thing. So I respect that thought process. Okay, nice. No disagreement so far. Mutual ground. I'm just, I'm just you know a real silver tongue. I'll talk my way out of anything. <laughs> please, <laughs> please stop calling yourself a silver tongue. Uh, <laughs> let's um, pitching. Uh, how many starting pitchers ended up making the top fifty? Strider's your one. Uh, Burns, Wheeler, uh, we've got Logan Webb, Max Freed, Pablo Lopez, George Kirby, Zach Gallen, and Garrett at the end. 
Uh, I guess who is the first pitcher off the list or, or maybe the two that were hurting you? And then I want to try to sort through these because like I told you last year, the pitchers for me, I, that's, I struggle the most with that. Well, I think one of the things you struggle with is how many pitchers do you even put on a list like this? Because right. I think I have about 12 on there. Someone could make the exact same list and maybe put five or six of them, you know, because yeah. think of how many, and we talked about this already, how many frontline guys are missing due to injury one way or another. We, you didn't even mention Brandon Woodruff, but that's another guy who's probably not going to pitch at all this year, uh, who was on the 50 last year. And so the way I kind of came after it was, okay, well, if all those guys are gone, doesn't that just mean the guys who can still throw 180 or 200 innings become more valuable in a way, you know, because there's, that just means that's fewer and fewer guys who can handle that uh, ACE workload. Now, as far as like who was left off the list pitcher wise, next up was definitely a hundred percent Luis Castillo. Mm. And, you know, I kind of went back on back and forth on, should I just put Castillo in the 50 spot because six months of Castillo is probably more valuable than four and a half months of Cole. No disrespect to Cole. Um, and then, uh, and then the, the next one would have been Yoshinobu Yamamoto. Mm. Uh, you know, that's, and that's one of those where, like we discussed earlier, could come back and hurt because, uh, he has that Cy Young upside. I ultimately didn't go with Yamamoto because I feel like the Dodgers are gonna be really careful with his workload this year. They have him on a, what is it? 12, 13 year deal. So there's no need to rush. He's only 25. And so he's going to probably pitch out of a six man rotation a lot throughout the season. And that's going to kind of limit his upside uh, to some degree. But um, yeah, those, it was definitely Castillo and Yamamoto on the outside looking in as far as pitching talent. Should have gone Yamamoto, man. Then you get the international click right off the bat. Uh, you know, New York versus Japan, the rivalry continues. Um, what rivalry? Uh, although I did hear, uh, I've never been into them. I heard the new King Kong Godzilla movies electric. Um, I can, I can talk about Godzilla for a good long time. So we'll, we'll save that for another okay. day. That's on the back end. Um, I want to, so the pitchers that did make the list Strider is so, he was an interesting combo last year. He's an interesting combo this year because I, I kind of need to see the, like, nail season out of him. And we all know it's coming. But uh, I think someone laughed. I, I said, and I, I forget if I was being mean or just being silly, but I said sometimes he gets a bad case of the gets rocked. Like, it just feels like his bad day happens and it's six earned runs where maybe Logan Webb just doesn't really have those. Um, that uh, seeing, I guess when I looked at the top three of Wheeler, Burns, and Strider, I think if I think if I really wanted to go to war with you, I think I'd put Burns ahead of Strider just because I have... I just feel like what I'm going to get over 162 is a little more stable. But again, arguing against Strider is ridiculous because he probably will strike out high three bills this year. Yeah, I you know, I think what people are waiting for with regards to Strider is a season like Burns had in 2021, right? Um, yeah, yeah. With regards to Strider, I just I I think you kind of hit the nail on the head when you said you know that the big season is coming. You know that the season with uh, an ERA that's probably in like the low twos is on its way. He had a three point eight six ERA last year. There are a lot of pitchers with a better ERA than that uh, on this list. Um, but you know, there's the the things that Spencer Strider does correlates uh to uh a lower eras in the future like striking out 37 percent of Everyone. the batters you face which no one else does uh so yeah we just know eventually he's going to make it happen and i think there's a lot of excitement with strider with regards to the third pitch uh the curveball uh because that is something he has been lacking i think we saw particularly in the playoff series versus the phillies um they were honed in on the slider because they knew that was that was that was the only breaking option they had to worry about uh his fastball is absolutely unhittable uh it is absolutely ridiculous but uh the slider at times is not as impressive and if you can uh you know get yourself into a favorable count like that was the pitch that uh people were hammering so yeah i mean i'm picking strider and that's just you know looking towards the future right maybe that's uh, you know, some of the same logic uh, that you could apply to why I should have put Adley ahead of JT Ramudo because maybe he's not the best yet, but he's clearly going to be. It's coming. Um, and I, I guess this one's just funny for me uh, because, again, we, we, you know, our, our Trevor Plouffe connection to the big league has the 
the original Harvard Westlake boys were were his guys. Freed, Giolito, Flaherty. Uh, Flaherty, hey, good first start. Detroit, big place to pitch. Go, go, knock him, knock him out, Jack. Giolito gets the the kind of friendly. Have a good year in two years, and you're gonna get a big boy contract. Uh, he gets TJ. Max Freed throughout the whole thing, like Giolito was kind of ace-ish for the White Sox when they were going to make their World Series run. Uh, Jack Flaherty was ace- ace-ish for St. Louis as their young guy. Max Freed, it, it feels like, I don't know, it feels like a Girl Next Door movie where it's like, wait, you've been here the whole time? Um, and like you said in the video, like, I think with anyone with 60 plus starts in the past four years or whatever, he does he have the best ERA? Which, yes, uh, he does. I, I mean, that that disqualifies that disqualifies Verlander, who's got him beat a little bit in some of those run prevention stats. Sure. If you lower the start threshold to like 50. Right. But as far as guys who have actually like been around and pitching in all those seasons, no one has been better in terms of run prevention than Freed, which kind of makes him the anti Strider in a way, because <laughs> Strider is all about perceived future run prevention. Freed already does it. He's done it in the past. He, he, does, he just doesn't allow a lot of runs. And, you know, I, this is where, again, I become old school. There's an old Italian man yells at baseball TV, summer, summer in the city. Uh, I'm all about run prevention. <laughs> like, that's, for me, that's the big one. Um, well, yeah, it's, I mean, I don't want to interrupt, but it's, it is the most important thing. Like we totally agree. What you have to do as a pitcher is you don't let the other team score runs and that's how you win. It's just a question of, okay, what do I think is more indicative of future run prevention, right. run prevention 2024? Is it going to be past run prevention? Oh, this guy had a good ERA last year. So obviously he's going to have a good ERA this year, or is it something else? Is it your strikeout rate and your walk rate, for example? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, uh, uh, enough about the pitchers, man. I'm 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 kind of over them. Uh, again, it's the Trevor Plouffe effect, man. He started pointing out how needy pitchers are, and you're like, damn, wait, they kind of they kind of are. Um, personal catchers. Let's get uh, to the rest of the fifty and mostly the hitters. And it's brought to you by the DraftKings Sportsbook. Head to the ballpark now, people. Baseball's underway. Uh, it's New York opening day on Friday. Trying to get over to that. Uh, go see your team play wherever they are and get in on the action with the DraftKings Sportsbook. New customers who bet $5 will get $150 in bonus bets instantly when you use our code BAKERS. Uh, they've got their same game parlays where you can rack up a couple bets, uh, and in doing that, you can get a bigger payout. Uh, and if it's not ready in your state yet, that's okay. DraftKings still has their daily fantasy to win a shot at cash prizes. So download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. New customers use promo code BAKERS. Bet just $5 on any wager and get $150 in bonus bets instantly. That's promo code BAKERS only at the DraftKings Sportsbook. The crown is yours. Uh, all right, Bailey, let me let me come in a little... I'll come in a little more wide. Uh, the Storielli method. Uh, I guess looking at this list now, a couple days removed... Um, one, is there any instant remorse five games into the season? Is there someone that you look at this list and you're like, son of a I, damn it. And then I guess going before that, when you were on the list, who was the guy that gave you the most hell on where to place them? Yeah, um, I mean, there there could be, you know, Freed and Nola had bad first starts. They were actually facing each yeah. other. Um, and so it's like, oh, oh boy, like is Luis Castillo just better than both those guys? And I got that wrong. Um, yeah. And then as far as who I had the most trouble placing, I actually had a lot of trouble with, uh, Luis Robert Jr. Okay. Uh, because he was someone like I nailed it last year, Jake. Like yeah. I absolutely, how many people would have put him on a top 50 list, you know, a year ago today, almost nobody. So I crushed it. And then he has the season that we were all hoping he could have. It's like, I think it's, I think he had like 30, 38 home runs and 20 stolen bases and gold glove defense or gold glove caliber defense in center. Um, and I, and I only moved him up from 48 to 38 because <laughs> I was nervous about some under the hood stuff, you know, including, including the strikeout rate. And I have, um, you know, Michael Harris, the second who's new to the list ahead of him. Um, so that, that I kind of had some trouble with because it's like, yes, you did exactly what I knew you could do and what we all thought you could do. And yet maybe I don't love the way you did it. 
Um, so that that was definitely uh, a really difficult thing uh, for me was was ranking him. Um, I, I I had some trouble with Bregman. Uh, he he's kind of ended up around this thirty spot, but um, he's just Mister Consistent, you know. But it's really tough to sort of rank him among the third baseman. Like I have him just ahead of Devers right there, and I think there's a lot of people who could argue that either way. Bregman was one that jumped out for me. Um, I. Huh, I don't know. I guess I guess for me it's finding the uh like it's now 2024. Um Bregman's 2019 season, that's just massive. 41 homers yeah. while leading the league in walks, 119 walks to 83 strikeouts. One dotted second in the MVP, like it's it's an insane season. Um and his 2018 leading into that was crazy that, I mean, that that list would have, you know, the 2020 list would have had Breggy top 10, probably. And this is your fourth list, right? That sounds I, right to me. I, I, I mean, so. I'm the guy who makes the list, but four sounds right. I, I think so. But uh, I guess for me, if I go from 2020 on, which it's, it's 2024, like that's, in baseball terms, there's guys' careers that, <laughs> that pass in that time period. Um Alex Bregman has been 260, 360, and 800 OPS, which is a 123 OPS plus. Um, he still plays a very high caliber uh, defense. I don't think he, he's never gotten the gold glove, but it's it's third base. That's There's a lot of guys that, that earn that. Um, that I don't know. I, I guess he was one that jumped out for me that he's in a contract year, and I'm always rooting for players in contract years. And like you said, the consistency... Um, I value that as well, but I, I was definitely looking at him like, I don't know if he can climb back up the list. And when you're looking at a lot of these names that concerns me because it, you know, even if I go through the forties right now, like Pete Alonzo, as you mentioned, he got hit in the hand. It, it changed his whole season. Pete Alonzo could put up a 50 burger this year. He almost did last year in a down season. Um, you know, you've mentioned your your qualms with Nolan Arenado <laughs> year in, year out. Um, and we know what his high end is capable of. Um, that Yeah, I guess for Bregman, I, I had a head tilt because it's just like, it could very well stay there, and Alex Bregman could be 30 again. Uh, but if he has a hiccup, it's going to be tough to argue about him going back up the ladder. Right. I mean, who is to say the value over the last few years between Alex Bregman and Xander Bogarts is really all that different, right? You know, uh, and one's at 30 and one's not on this list. So that's that's one that I look at. And then I do, I also want to point out, and these are like more fairly obvious, hard to rank. Uh, obviously, Trout and Otani. Obviously, yeah. that is that is tough. And I don't want to skip ahead. Uh, but then another one, honestly, Matt Olson. Okay. Matt Olson was a tough one for me because when I was running the numbers, I have fully convinced myself he was a top 10 player. And he ends up at, at 12 here because I, I think just, I don't know, some of these players ahead of them have more name brand value. They have like a longer history at that elite level. But I mean, Matt Olson has been insane two of the last three seasons, you know, and he just kind of had a good one in between. Goodish. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're talking to a, a Matt Olson Hiver. Um, and, you know, when you put him and him and Freddie's numbers next to each other, they they can get very similar. But uh, again, you're starting to get to a a special part of the list. Um, and that's another place where you deserve compliments from last year. And I again, I don't want to go full Tony Robbins in you and, and say, hey, believe Bailey, be you. Uh, you were on the Corey Seager hellbent train last year. Um, and then he was, <laughs> um, yeah, that it he, happened that, yeah, he, he ends up fourth on this list. Um, yeah, I guess. All right. You, you jump to the, you jump to the meat and potatoes there and I like it. Aaron judge number one playing to the fan. No, um, no, I, I think that's right. Right. As, and this is, I, I guess the caveat is, again, this is for 2024. So Shohei, who probably would be the guy giving him the most run for that, if he was pitching this year, he probably gets the nod because it's Shohei. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I guess between him and Ronald Acuna Jr., who uh, Judgey has another banged up year. Again, I, I'm a little too close to the situation where I do feel like they are 
I don't want to say fluky because maybe, I don't know. In my head, Judge is an injury prone. Maybe that's some Yankee denial. Um, but even in his limited action, he was on a home run, a, a American League home run, a record pace last year. Uh, so I guess for him and Ronald Acuna Jr., when, when you're really drawing straws at the end of the day, is it is it the value between home runs? Is it the value between just Judge's best is better? Or how, how did you do that? Well, Judge's, so far, what we've seen, Judge's best is better. The season that Judge had in 2022 is better than the season Acuna had in 2023. Um, Acuna's is sexy from like a power speed you know, scenario like this is something we've never seen, but you know, Judge was, uh, you know, getting on base more and he was slugging a lot more. And I think this was really key for me. The defensive gap between Acuna and Judge is greater than people think, uh, and it it is going to make up for, uh, you know, the gap in base stealing, as far as I'm concerned, because Judge is capable of playing like a league averageish center field, which is extremely valuable. Yeah. And Acuna, really, since he's come back from the injury, has been a negative in right field. He looks like, in terms of his athleticism, there's no reason why he can't be a plus right fielder. I think it's it's a, sort of a lack of confidence after the, the ACL tear. He tore his ACL uh, around the warning track when he slipped, and he just seems really like sheepish moving back towards the wall in any sort of scenario. He's, he's not taking those risks. He's still got a great arm, but... Um, so if both these guys are fully healthy, like there is a pretty significant gap between a negative right fielder and like an average center fielder uh, in Major League Baseball. And uh, and I think Judge overall, higher offensive upside. The pace he was on last year, he had a higher barrel rate than he did uh, in 2022 when he broke the AL home run record. Uh, and that's that's a stat that's, you know, really important for projecting like uh, any sort of like future performance. So. Uh, that that's ultimately why I went w- with Judge at number one. It's it's the gap in in defensive value, and uh, the fact that I think Judge still possesses this higher offensive upside because Acuna offensively has not had a season, uh, you know, like Judge did in 2022. Yeah, I mean, again, I'm I'm not going to counter counter back too much on the big fella. Um, he's when he's right, it's it's just kind of unreal. Uh, Shortstop Mookie Betts, man, is he just breaking everything? Like I, you know, I know we've both played a lot of out of the park baseball, and he's ended up at second base, and it's like, yes, computer, this is fun. Uh, now it's way too real, and he's playing shortstop for the Los Angeles, like a super team. What is this? It's so weird, and the more I, I even look at it, I'm just like these guys have been trying to trade for Willie Adamas for like three or four years now, and he's still not there. And then they come into spring training and they're saying, hey, Gavin Lux is our shortstop and Mookie Betts is our second baseman. And I think even then we're all kind of like tugging our shorts. Like, really? Like, is that yeah. is that th- is that your plan? I mean, Gavin Lux hasn't played in a year. Um, he is at no point proven that he's a, a MLB capable shortstop. Uh, and then halfway through spring training, they're like, you know what? Just flip flop him. We'll just flip flop him. We'll put Mookie Betts at shortstop. I don't know if Mookie Betts is gonna, you know, play a shortstop that grades out particularly well according to the, to the defensive metrics. He didn't really even do that at second base last year. Like if he was just trying to accrue the most WAR, it's probably still in right field where he's like all world, all time great. Um, even but yeah, it's it's like. I think the average like baseball fan needs to understand that like there is a defensive spectrum and uh, certain positions are easier and harder than others. Uh, And, you know, so the easier positions might be like first base or corner outfield and the tougher positions might be, you know, anything up the middle, like catcher, shortstop, second base center. When you are past the age of 30, you don't move up the defensive spectrum you don't play a more difficult position that never happens like like Mookie Betts uh you know he's supposed to move from right field to DH when he gets older you know what I mean he's not supposed to move from right field to shortstop um you know he's supposed to do uh the inverse he's supposed to do what Tatis did where he struggled at shortstop and then won a platinum glove and right this isn't supposed to happen it's it's and it's like and then What's tricky is I have him right next to Corey Seager right there, who like, you know, has is a shortstop, has a history of growing up and playing shortstop and has always been a shortstop. And it's like, 
okay, I have to think of Mookie Betts as a shortstop now and rank him accordingly. Um, but like, what does that even mean? I, I did an episode of Wake and Jake where I basically walked all over myself because I was like, I'm rooting for Mookie Betts, but he's also like breaking, he's breaking the game. Um, yeah, this, this isn't supposed to happen. And yeah, him and him and Corey Seager back to back. I mean, that's I, I, I was literally I was losing my mind one day because if Mookie Betts has, if he has an average defensive season and he hits like Mookie Betts, like there's an argument he's one of the best shortstops of all time. Like, right? I, I don't, I don't know, man. I, I almost want to spin out of it because it, it starts to make me a little dizzy. Um, can I ask you a dumb question? If you don't mind. I mean, you've asked me plenty already, yeah, so we're, continue. We're already in it. Um, who's the best hitter in baseball? You, you mentioned, you know, position, and, you know, Mookie's going to have an interesting argument if he has an average shortstop season. Um, I guess who's the best hitter in baseball? No questions asked. I, I think it's Jordan Alvarez on a rate basis. I think he is the best um his past two seasons have been absolutely monstrous and i think with alvarez like there's just no weakness to what he does there he you know hitting is this constant seesaw bet- between contact quantity and contact quality so a hitter you know comes into a season and says you know oh, oh bellinger good example last year right bellinger said you know what i'm gonna choke up on the bat with two strikes i'm not gonna strike out as much and you know what what's, what's gonna happen my average exit velocity is going to go down and my barrel rate's not going to be that impressive, but I'm going to have a good offensive season mm-hmm. because I want more contact quantity. With Yaron Alvarez, he never seems to make any sacrifice. Like this is right. the power numbers he's able to put up are are in the range of Judge, but the difference is Judge is going to strike out, you know, between 25 and 30% of the time and Yaron's going to keep his strikeout rate under 20, you know? Like, so it's just, and he's younger and so, you know, like the, the bummer with Jordan is he's always kind of beat up. He hasn't, he's, he's never had 600 plate appearances in a season. Like that is, you know, he's come really close, but he's never had 600 plate appearances in a season. Um, but like just on a rate basis, like at bat for at bat, I do think Jordan is the best in the game. Uh, he is uh, remarkable. I, I said in the Foolish 50 video, it reminds me of David Ortiz because Ortiz was able to, like if you look at David Ortiz's baseball reference page, you're like, oh, big power hitter DH probably struck out a lot, right? No. Yeah. No, he didn't. Like it's it's absolutely insane. Big Poppy, man. He uh he was he was really fun to watch. I it there was a lot of heartbreaking moments, but him and Manny, man, it was it was like <laughs> it was cool and it sucked. <laughs> it's like these are this is one of the best lefty righty combos ever. And that's uh that's probably why all these Goddamn Yankee fans are marching around the the office like an episode of Arthur or something because the Soto Judge back to back, um, it's it feels special and Judge hasn't even gone yet, which which that's crazy. Um, what episode of Arthur was there marching around? You know, it's tough to say, but I just picture them doing like a high handed bop. That's uh, in the title sequence. Is that That's, in the it intro? Starts, he's walking down the street, but it's just him, you know? I'm trying to think because I never watched it, but maybe like... I Listen, I've watched a lot of Arthur in my heyday, if, you know? It feels like it was a big... You know what it, I think it was? When there was snow days and my mom still had to go to work, I would go over to our neighbor's house, who it was a girl like three grades below me, which was the... And we were the age when like you didn't talk to... Uh, a girl three grades below you and it was like their her grandparents and I think just it was kind of like Arthur was on and like nobody drew their weapons it was like everyone's okay with this like even the grandparents were like this is kind of fine right um yeah it's it's public television it has to be good so I think that's where I was consuming Arthur again we'll circle back on that later um <laughs> let's see uh I guess one of the questions I want to ask you and you mentioned Luis uh, Robert Jr. Uh, center field. I did tier list with Happy Grape. Um, and center field was the one that got, I don't want to say, I think center field got the ugliest for me because I was too chicken to hit the button. I'm too, I'm too nervous to anoint Julio. Um, I 
looking at his first half numbers from two seasons, I know I shouldn't care about that, but I do. Um, and then I question, like, if Luis Robert was on a better team, how would I view him? Um, and yet, I do think playing in games that matter matters. Um, and then there's Michael Harris, too. Again, he's doing the Arthur dance all the way to an incredible season himself. So, uh, I guess Julio, like, does deserve to be ahead of those guys, but it's almost like he doesn't yet. Yeah, it, I see what you're saying. I, you know, when I, when I look at Julio and what he's done these first two seasons, it, it to me, it just comes back to the to the defense. And look, Harris and Luis Robert play extremely high level defense, but so does Julio. Like he is on right. par with those guys. And I think that sort of defied expectations because, uh, you know, when he was coming through the the system and like he was getting all big and muscular, and he was, you know, we were like, okay, this is gonna be a great power hitter. We knew that. And but we figured, oh, maybe he'll bulk up too much and he'll just be like a really good corner. And it's like, no, he is like a legitimately one of the best defensive center fielders and he steals a lot of bases. Um, yeah, I mean, as, as far as placing Julio, I like where I've gotten, but I think a lot of people would argue for him higher, like in a top 10 spot. I think a lot of people would argue for him ahead of Mike Trout. Um, but yeah, I the, the thing with Julio is he did offensively take a little bit of a step back last year. And, uh, and that's why people, like people laughed that Julio was like, frustrated with his sophomore season because he was like a six war player because right. again he steals bases and plays insanely good defense and center um but uh it's like yeah he did step back a little bit and um really a lot of his production came in like a three-week span uh offensively uh so you know i know you guys over there like to say you what do you, you you butter knife it? Is yeah. that what you do over there? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, if you could butter knife it to make him look really good, or maybe you know more on par with these guys like uh, Harris and Luis Robert. But I think the thing with with Julio is yeah, he's had he just had like back to back six war seasons. It's the first two years of his career, and he's like twenty three now. You know, so yeah, that's that's nobody does that. I mean, you know who does that when they first come up into the league at a very young age? Mike Trout. Right. Right. Uh, Willie Mays. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I. I get all of it with Julio, and I think I've laid out like he's my. I think we we did some dark horse type type bets, and like Julio, it's not even a dark horse. Or I no, think he might have been like your yeah, your we, honest to god pick. We did we did like hey, if this honest to god, you know, who do you think will be family dog's life is on the line versus if we were doing like the clickbait local radio show. And, you know, uh, I think I said AL life on the line, Julio is my safest bet just because if the full year happens, I think it's a no-brainer. And I think Judge and Soto are just kind of going to elbow each other out of the way. I, I do believe in that. Um, and I forget who my clickbait one was. Um, but, yeah, I, I don't know. At, so, like, the same time I'm arguing against him that he should still be in the bucket with Harris and Robert... He also shouldn't. Clickbait was Adley. Clickbait was Adley. Which, again, I don't know. Depending which local radio station I'm on. Um, let's see. There was another... Oh, I want to talk uh, Bobby Witt Jr. with you. Mm. And Gunnar Henderson. Um, Gunnar Henderson comes in at 28. Bobby Witt comes in at 18. I have been... Gunnar Henderson has been an internal crisis for me for about two weeks now, just because it's like I, I've given this speech, I think, three full times now, so I'll keep it high and tight to you. Adley Rushman, I know everything about him. The Oregon State tackle on McCaffrey. Uh, he loves I think you should leave. He, his opening day at home plate, whoa. Um, you know, Adley's like MLB's guy. They promoted the hell out of him. All in on Adley. Uh, Jackson Holiday, MLB Guys Part 2. I know his father. I, I know he's engaged. I know he slept in the batting cage. I've got a, I have mm. nothing on Gunnar Henderson, except he won Rookie of the Year. Uh, he got better as the year went on. Um, and I think if we're, going, if we're going strictly like war in numbers, I think he outdid Bobby Witt last year, or at least it's close, that I'm, I'm wondering, I'm wondering the, the gap between you 
you have between those two? I don't think he he outdid Bobby okay. Witt. Um, I think the the separator there, and it's it's tough to base your expectations off this because the thing about Bobby Witt Jr. is he went from I think negative eight to plus ten at shortstop uh, between his rookie and sophomore year, and and Gunner was I think probably more like a league averages shortstop and also you know uh, plenty of time at third base in there. Um, although he'll play more shortstop this year. Um, so, th- so that's a difference. And then the base stealing as well, yeah. like Bobby Witt Jr. Stole 49. Uh, I don't know how many gunners stole off the top of my head. Uh, maybe in the teens, not a lot. 10. Uh, yeah. 10. Uh, so, uh, and gunners a really good base runner, by the way, it's just not the base stealing. Um, but yeah, uh, that's, that's sort of a separator for me. And, um, so yeah, I would say, I would say Bobby Witt Jr. Had, had a better year, but it's more of a question of, okay, if Bobby Witt Jr. Was a plus 10 shortstop last year does that mean he's gonna that's what he is now or you know are relying on singles season sample size for advanced defensive right. metrics a really bad idea and and maybe now he's just an average defensive shortstop in which case i would strongly consider dropping him you know below the likes of gunner henderson uh because this is with the expectation that he is uh, very much a plus defensive shortstop who is gonna steal you know close to 50 bags and hit, you know, 30, maybe even 40 home runs. We'll see. Um, but yeah, the, so I, I, I view them as separate tiers, but I think it comes down to what the advanced defensive metrics say, because there's no reason why at the end of the season, you know, th- these things are so finicky. Maybe, maybe they'll say Gunner is a better defensive shortstop than Bobby Witt Jr., in which case you flip-flop them. Right, and I guess that's where I, I was going off B-War, which again, I don't, I don't, live, I don't live by that, but I, I think Gunner was a... What was he a six point two last year? And Bobby was, I think he was like a four eight or something. Which again, I don't, I don't live by that. But it is, it's just funny putting those two names down on paper because I think you're right. Like with what Bobby can do with his speed, and um, again, this is where Gunner's bizarre to me because, like what you said about his defense, like yeah, I don't know, he's Gunner Henderson. Like I've just, I've never said that about other prospects who have won Rookie of the Year and are on, like, the best team in the American League last year. And it's like he's just, he's overhyped by the prospect before him and the prospect after him. And I'm guessing, I, I think he's a Southern boy that probably doesn't want to do the interviews that Adley's about, um, and currently Jackson Holiday's doing that. I don't know. I'm, my wheels are spinning on him because I, I, I don't, you just don't see that. You don't see a top prospect, rookie of the year, performs got better and yet like i don't there's just like a droll energy around it yeah the the other thing is with gunner like it's not particularly exciting to watch he's just kind of good at everything you know like if you were a scout you'd be like you'd give him just like a 60 across the board at everything and that makes you a phenomenal player you know or like a 55 uh and then at the end of the year you go look at it and you're like well he racked up a lot of war um, but what's the standout feature of his game? You know, that it's not, right. it, he's Somebody just good at everything. How he plays. There's not a, an answer to that question. Good. Yeah. He's a good player is what it is. That was, uh, that was the minor, minor league scouting report on a young Glaber Torres. And just like, he's good. And it's like, Oh, okay, great. At, and they're just like, Oh, a good ball player. Perfect. Yeah. They're like, well, he can hit the ball, but he can also hit it hard. Um, and then the ball goes into his glove and he throws it and that all looks fine. Like I got to get into scouting because it, it seems yeah. like if, if that works. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's, let's start to wind it down. I, I guess if now looking at the list, uh, who do you have as a potential like big riser? I was going to say cr- Cracks the top ten. Some of those names, it just feels impossible. Um, yeah. I, I guess, who on this list are you looking at that they could be a huge... And maybe it doesn't have to be a top ten. Like, may, maybe you're drinking the Bo Bichette stock and you think he could go from 44 to 14. Like, I, I guess, who do you see as the big potential risers on this list? Here's what we'll do. I'll pick one from each column there. Sure. Uh, so we'll we'll start with the far right column, which are the higher ranked guys. Austin Riley can move yeah. into a top ten spot. Like he, I, he would he would kind of be my uh, honest to god pick an MVP for the National League choice. Either okay. him or like Harper. Uh, those are kind of the guys who I'm like, yeah, it'll, it'll probably be one of those guys that wins MVP in the National League. Uh, he's he's been playing at a consistent level these past three years. 
but there is that feeling deep down that there could be another level unlocked. And and if that's the case now, now all of a sudden he's up there with Freddie Freeman, you know, around five, um, second column guy who could jump up quite a bit. I'm going to go, Ooh, this is a good one. You know what? I'm going to say it's fairly obvious, but I'll say Tatis, right? Cause yeah. I think everyone knows there's MVP upside there. He's one of the more popular MVP picks. Um, I'm sort of at 19 kind of playing the wait and see game. That's about where I had him last year. Anyways, I'm like, I, I believe it's possible, but I'm not, uh, you know, like I'm not necessarily ranking him as if I think, you know, he's going to win an MVP award at 19 there. Um, and then, uh, let's see far left column there who could move up quite a bit. Mm, you know what? I'm going to say out of all of these guys, this is an interesting one. I mean, Vladdy seems like the most obvious answer, but I'm going to flip it on its head a little bit. I'm going to say Adolis. I thought you might say that. I, I like the, because... I, I liked how excited you got when you talked about him in, in, the, in your video. I'm so excited. I was because, you know, if you'd asked me a year ago how I feel about Adolis, like I would have observed, uh, you know, oh, he cut his strikeout rate a little there between 2021 and 2022. And he was still playing really good defense in the outfield and everything's looking nice and sustainable. And then to see him, you know, make that next step between 2022 and 2023 was awesome. It was yeah. so awesome. He's still playing plus defense out there in the outfield and the ch the chase rate is way down. So now he's, you know, rocking a double digit walk rate. And what's so fun about this guy is he's basically come from nowhere to be a like uh, an everyday player in Major League Baseball. He's he's like, what, 30 or 31 now, but he's only been an everyday player in Major League Baseball for three years now. So compared to, you know, the average player his age uh you know who's probably been around for much longer it's easier to project him to continue to improve uh because of you know the, he, he's still kind of new at this and uh he's and what all he's done is get better every year that he's played so uh if he continues to build up that track record yeah he could really launch himself in a conversation of being one of the top outfielders period um so yeah and i and i'm just a big fan of his game he's he's just so fun to watch like like Seeger and Simeon, we know why the, they brought those guys in. They are professionals. They show up every day. They play hard, but they they're not particularly animated or expressive. And so it's like, like yes, they are the engine, but like Adolis is like the heart and soul of that team, like emotionally. And that's that's what I really enjoy about him. Three homers in four games early on this season. I'm sure if I wanted to get a tweet with some likes off, I could go back and add his playoff games to that and Adolis probably yeah. has he probably has like 10 homers in his last 10 games or something maybe I will fire that off um yeah I, I guess you know pitchers are kind of illegal I'm I'm all in on George Kirby he he just something about him feels it feels different um just it's coming in the zone and I don't really care what you do with it um, I, I think that's impressive and yeah, I don't, I don't know. I guess I circled that Gunnar Henderson, Corbin Carroll area because something about them, something about them isn't flashy, but if they get better, I mean, their numbers are start to get in silly spots, especially, um, you know, I know Corb Corbin's now filling in at center field, but I guess for him, it's like if his numbers take a boost and for Gunner, it becomes a shortstop argument of like, if he does yeah. that at shortstop another year or a little bit better, I, you know, that's Corey Seager light, which I, I think who just, com I think Trev compared them on talking baseball. And I was like, Ooh, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's probably more upside defensively and on the base pass than Seager, you know? Just tough to tough to compare to anyone that, uh, you know, Corey Seager is now a top three hitter in the game for me. Um, that to to put that on any prospect who has a <laughs> season with an OPS in the eight hundreds, you just you don't want to do that. Um, and you know, I maybe this is just my Yankees coming out. Uh, who I could argue this the other way. Rafael Devers, dude, I, he's just better than how his last year finished. That like, I don't. There's gonna be the Rafi top three MVP year is going to happen at some point, and yeah. I don't know if it's this year or next or whatever. But one year, we're just gonna look down and be like, oh, yeah, he won dotted. One thing I will say in my defense with Devers is like he had a worse year, 
2023 than he did in 2022. And I basically ranked him the exact same because I was right. like, yeah, but I don't think that's who you are. Yeah, I mean, the Sox season fell apart and it's just like that guy can hit a lot. Um, uh, last question, who will be off the list next year? Be mean. Yeah, it could be... Um, Ooh, you know, I one guy who I have left off one year and got a lot of flack for it was Bo Bichette. Um, like I just I'm a little like I'm a lot of people think I'm like a Blue Jays hater because I have come sure. on this program and expressed doubts about the Blue Jays well, that were immediately proven to be correct. That's because uh, you're not a Blue Jays teenage fan. Um, if you're right. n- if you're not a Blue Jays teenage fan, you are a Blue Jays hater. Yeah, well, it's, it, you know, and it's like, uh, you know, if you're, you know, if you're not a Blue Jays fan when you're a teenager, you know, you have no heart. Yeah. And if you're not a Blue Jays hater when you're almost 30, you have no brain, yeah. you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, but no, it, he's like, I just want to see him do something different. You know, he's yeah. been kind of doing the same thing. I would love to see him do something different or else it's just going to be like, it's the upside argument, right? Yeah. Like if this guy is just going to be the 45th best player in baseball every year, like what's the, okay. When it gets down to those spots in the forties, maybe I want to try a guy who I think might win MVP out of nowhere, you know? Yeah. Uh, so it's the same argument there. You know, who's one guy who I think like it's, it's easy to, t- to eye the old guys. Like people are probably right. look at, licking their chops. Like, Hey, Paul Goldschmidt, like this is it. Hope you enjoyed it. I'm not so sure. I, I believe, I believe in Goldie. I think the process has been pretty good these last few years. So I would not be surprised if he moves up the list, uh, if anything, but yeah, I'm, I'm thinking Bo could drop off. And then I'm sure some of these pitchers will, I'm sure between Freed, Nola and Gallon, like one of these guys is going to stumble and not, and have a not so great year. And then maybe some of those other pitchers we talked about come back, uh, and they're, you know, contenders for the list. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's what I'm eyeing. Yeah, the other one, this one's just rude, and it's a little bit organization and age in their baseball card, but, like, at some point, Yandy Diaz has to stop being right. incredible. Um, I don't know. I, I could be very wrong, and maybe he's just going to ride this out, but the the fact that he has become <laughs> amazing is just mind-blowing. If you look over the past two seasons, he's probably, like, the sixth best hitter in baseball over the past two seasons. Dude, he, um, let's see. I just, since 2020, I mean, he's a 138 OPS plus, um, which yeah, last year, 159, my God. Um, WRC plus since the start of 2022. So two full years in almost a week. Uh, Yandy Diaz is the seventh highest WRC plus. Yeah. So yeah. like, and I mean, and all those guys ahead of them, I'm sure are hovering around the top ten on this list. It's just yeah, six to one: Shohei, Altuve, Betts, Freeman, Alvarez, Judge. Yeah, yeah, that uh, that tracks as the kids are saying. Um, Bailey, uh, as always, I appreciate you. Uh, doing a list like this is. One of the things that makes sports beautiful and one of the things that makes sports, sports stink because it's like, oh, my God, it's like Seager and Betts this year? I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't know. If, if Seager gives me 130 games, if Betts can play shortstop after the age of 30. Um, so I, uh, I, I know it's a big annual video for you, and I'm, I'm glad it's uh, partially became attached to this. Um, so thank you, man. What, uh, what else you got coming up? Uh, well, one thing I've got coming up is more appearances on this show. Yeah. Uh, I think we, I think people will be happy to hear that, that I will be, uh, what do you want to call it? Semi regular. Yeah. Uh, what are we shooting for a couple of months? Maybe. I think we're aiming for like two a month, two a month. Yeah. When, when I, when, uh, you know, we, we had some very extensive, uh, you know, contract negotiations yeah. I, I held out. Um, but one, one thing you did offer to me a few months ago when, uh, I was riffing on, I guess, I don't even know why this was necessarily news now that I think about it, but people were talking about uh, how uh, the McAfee show, the Pat McAfee show pays Aaron Rodgers for appearances. Yes. And then, you know, I came at you like Price of the Bailey just went up because I didn't know you could get paid yeah. for that. Um, you, you made me an offer and uh, you offered me, I could get one weekend uh, visitation with BBD yep. mm. uh, or you could give me a pass that makes me the third We Got Ice member. Right. And I said yes, not realizing I had to choose between those two things because obviously you offered them both. Yeah. I mean, that's a no-brainer for me. So I've, I want you to know I've made my decision. 
Um, I'm going to take BBD mm. because I think if I play my cards right, I can still convince people that I'm Zoe. Ooh, you can okay. just do that. Okay, and yeah. that, that can become your leverage to get into We Got Ice with Jack. And, like, you can drive Zoe's price way down. Yeah, like, I know, because it's a supply and demand thing. The people probably shoot. only demand one Zoe, but what if I supply a second? And, I mean, you get BBD, that's, you know, that's essentially a conjugal visit. Um, so I think, <laughs> I think you made the right choice. Undies are selling. Uh, <laughs> hope, hope you like this wood paneling, BBD. <laughs> yeah. mm. Hello. Um, I'm excited, man. Uh, it's going to be, it's going to be a fun season. I cannot wait uh, to uh, get you and Jolly Olive uh, against each other somehow. Um and in a way, you guys are doing something baseball's deserved and needed for a long time, uh, and you're both really nice guys. So I just want to – I need to make – we either need to make you guys, like, best fucking friends, and that's baseball's mm -hmm. future, or you guys just need to hate each other. I, I don't want to live in a middle area. I want, I want us to be the next Skip and Shannon. You know, like, that's <laughs> – Ride high for a while. Uh-huh. <laughs> Yep. And then at the end of it, yep. I want to be interviewing Cat Williams, so we know which one I am. Okay. All right. You've you you've laid it out. Um, Bailey, I'll, I'll send the people over to Foolish Baseball and Foolish Bailey. That's right. Okay. Thanks. Um, and I think I'll, I'll do one last taster thing. I think I saw a tweet I liked from you, and I did want to compliment it. Oh, God, I just clicked. I clicked on Foolish Gamers. What account is that? That ha that's like a very popular gaming YouTuber with yeah. the kids, and I didn't know it existed, but he's like 10 oh times God. more popular than me. If you could get him on this show, you'd probably offer him BBD and We Got Eyes simultaneously. Um, I wanted to, A, uh, you know, sometimes we're, we have the group setting up here that, you know, I think when someone else hits a milestone, Jolly gets 100K subscribers, we all give him claps. I, I wanted to give you your flowers. Um you were able to tweet out six hours ago, babe, wake up, it's Louis Varlin bump day, and get a 1,000 likes on that tweet. That's a special place, man. That's nice. Congrats to you and Louis. Um, That's engagement right there. <laughs> Bailey, thank you. We'll be seeing you again soon. And uh, go baseball. Go baseball. Boom.